Uh, welcome everyone, and as Milo mentioned, this is the second session we are having with Eden, so I'll keep this introduction very short. Uh, so Eden comes with a background in physics and electrical engineering. He previously worked as a signal processing algorithm developer at Apple, and then he moved on to complete his uh, further education in quantum, advanced education in quantum dynamics at Imperial College London. He also co-founded the Imperial Quantum Tech Society. And now at Classic, he, um, yeah, he, he is working as um, a managing all of exciting stuff over there. Uh, with Romanium, he has joined um, to deliver the course, but also take care of a project in Romanium Classic Collaborations. So we'll learn about that too. So with that, let's welcome Eden. Over to you, Eden. Thank you very much, Vardan, for again introducing me so nicely. Um, can you hear me well and see my screen? Yes. Perfect. So, so last time we discussed about the Classic 101. It was the first introductory session to, um, to Classic and what's going on with quantum algorithm development in general. In today's session, we are uh, we're doing the first part of the two, two sessions of quantum primitives with Classic. And there was a question last time, what are quantum primitives? And I hope by the end of today's session, you will better understand what are quantum primitives and you will implement them by yourself with some nice examples. So what you will be yeah, gaining by the end of this session today. So first you understand the difference between circuit synthesis or compilation and transpilation and why compilation is more beneficial. Now, this is a topic from um, the first session. I want to touch on a few things following the homework assignment that you had and following some questions um, from the Discord channel. So we'll start with this. Then I want you to understand what are the swap test and the Hadamard test, including some hands-on implementations that you will be doing in today's session and also in the homework assignment. And you understand when to use these quantum primitives. So these, these will be the first two quantum primitives we'll see. So quantum primitives are some let's say small or a common quantum algorithm building blocks. So they usually are used as part of a larger quantum algorithm. And today we'll see an example. And I want you to understand today when we want to use these specific uh, two quantum primitives. So let's start with key insights from a uh, homework one. And we will discuss on the topic of compilation versus transpilation, uh, the followed by many question, following many questions we had in the Discord chat. So, this is a great work and great homework submission done by uh, Christina Radian. So uh, very well done for the homework assignment that you've submitted. And now I'm showing you part of what she, she has submitted. So these, um, if we're going back to the homework assignment of the first, um, the first session, you had to create, to model a multi-control node with five control qubits and one target qubit, and then to synthesize it, for minimal width and then for minimal depth and then sometime, somewhere in between. So here we can see two types of circuit implementation of a multi-control knot. So this is a common building block or common, let's say gate or algorithmic function of quantum computing. The first one uses six qubits. So five control qubits and one target qubit. This is the minimal um, number we can, we can have for this kind of implementation. And we see this is optimized for width. Now, at the second time, we optimize for depth. So we want to have a minimal circuit depth. And for this, there are more qubits that can be used. And the synthesis engine of Classic automatic, automatically determines that the, the further qubits can be used in order to uh, decrease the circuit depth. So here we can see the examples and we can see that the, the underlying circuit implementation is completely different. Right, so here we can see um, one type of implementation on the bottom, and on the top we can see another implementation. Of course, um, she chose to show and demonstrate specific uh, hierarchy or specific level of the hierarchy of the circuit implementation, and both this um, and this gate and these this gate can be further decomposed into one and two qubit gates. Now, this is something that I wanted you to do at home. And then it gives you uh, the first examples you coded hands-on, what's going on with taking a high-level description of a multi-control node of some quantum algorithm, and then synthesizing it, compiling it into low-level circuit implementation. Now, there were many questions about what's the difference between um, transpilation and compilation and synthesis. So I will walk through a small example that I hope will help you understand it better. So here I have some quantum algorithm. 
So I initialized one qubit for a quantum variable x, then I apply some Hadamard on x, then I apply the function called Eden. I don't know, I don't tell you what this function is doing, but this is a quantum function that I apply on the quantum variable x, and then I do it the inverse of x. Okay. So the quantum program circuit that I will receive will be like this. So I have a Hadamard and then I apply the Eden. So this is the function Eden. I call it Eden. And then I apply the inverse of the function. Now I'm telling you that the function implements a X. So the, the not gate and then Hadamard. So this is actually what's going on in the quantum program circuit, right? So I have Hadamard and then I have XH. So this is the function Eden and they have inverse Eden. So it's HX. And this is the underlying quantum program circuit. However, the transpired circuit is just Hadamard gate, right? Why is that? Because two consecutive gates, we can, or two consecutive party gates, we can cancel them out. So Hadamard after Hadamard is like the identity. So they are canceled out. And then we are left with X followed by X. And then we are remained only with the Hadamard um, gate. So I hope this example clarifies what's the difference between the quantum program circuit and the transpired circuit. So the quantum program circuit retains the functional hierarchy in the circuit, as we've seen here, right? So we retain, we start from the functionality that we want, and then we can zoom into the low level circuit implementation on the bottom figure, but it retains the functional, um, the functional hierarchy in the circuit. On the other hand, the transpired circuit is the circuit of further circuit optimization. So as we've seen in the example, we could cancel out two identical gates that are in consecutive applied on, on a specific qubit. And this is some further tweaks, some further optimization we are doing on top of the circuit itself. So these are the difference between the quantum program circuit that we've, we can view on the classic visualization tool using the classic visualization tool and the transpired circuit. And we have both information, the information of both. So the number of qubits will be identical in both. But the transpired circuit can um, further optimize the, the, the circuit itself with some simple tricks or like common tricks like canceling to um, consecutive Pauli um, gates. Now, in part B of the homework assignment, I ask you to uh, do sort of the same, but for a multi-control node with 20 controls and one target qubit. Now, Christina took it one step further, and this is a very nice graph and a very uh, great work that she's done. So what are we seeing here? On the x-axis, we can see the, the width, the number of qubits used for the specific uh, circuit implementation of the 20 control and one target, the MCX with 20 control and one target. So this is how many qubits we used. Now on the y-axis, we can see the circuit depth or the total gate count. So on green, we can see the total gate count that we used. Uh, but for now, we'll focus on the program depth. So this is the quantum program that retains the functional hierarchy and on the transpired circuit uh, depth. So we are focusing on the blue graph and on the red graph. What the synthesis engine, the compilation, what it enables us to do is to go from an implementation with 22 or 21 qubits to go to use some auxiliary qubits, to use 30 qubits instead of just the minimal number and to reduce the circuit depth by this amount. Transpilation, what it allows us to do is for a given um, circuit width, so for a given number of qubits, we can further optimize the circuit depth. Now let's understand what is um, more beneficial or how beneficial is each one of the steps. So with compilation, when we go from this implementation, let's say with 22 qubits, and the circuit depth is roughly uh, 2,500 or 2,900, I don't remember the exact numbers, we can use more auxiliary qubits. And the goal here was to um, optimize for depth. So we can use eight more qubits and to reduce the depth by 29 times. So it's like almost 30 times improvement, which is super significant. Now, this is allowed only from the fact that we started from a high level um, description of the algorithm, high level description of the multi-control node, and then we synthesize it. We compiled it into a circuit implementation. And during the compilation, during the synthesis, so Christina asked the synthesis engine to compile it once for 23 qubits, for 24 qubits, et cetera, et cetera, until um, 30 qubits and to optimize for depth. Now this, um, when we enlarge the circuit width, we are able to 
um, shortening the circuit depth, and we get a substantial reduction in circuit depth, which is most of the time this, the, the thing that we are interested in. Now, in transpilation, we are going from the program depth to the transpise uh, program depth, depth. So this is this reduction, and we receive a reduction of up to, let's say, two times reduction in circuit depth. So it depends on which um, on which uh, vertical line we are looking on, so on how many qubits. But these are the numbers that uh, we can understand in terms of the reduction in circuit depth that are enabled by compilation or by the synthesis engine on one hand and by the transpilation on the other. So now we can understand the difference between transpilation. So this is once we are given a quantum circuit, we can further tweak it, the further optimize it. And the compilation is taking a high level description or the synthesis uh, operation, taking a high level description of the algorithm of the model that we have. So for example, to have a MCNX with 20 control and one target qubit, and then to create some underlying circuit implementation of it. And this is where the, the vast majority of, of um, optimization can be done. So here we can see that we receive for this specific example, a reduction of almost 30 times compared to two times reduction. And just to, to elaborate a bit more, the MCX is a, a key ingredient in many quantum algorithms we have. So for example, in Grover algorithm, most of the oracles that we use, uses MCX within them. So this is the reduction in circuit depth that we receive only for one MCX. Now imagine how efficient more we can make the, the implementation of our algorithm if we use a synthesis engine and we have many, many, many MCX within our algorithm. So this is a sub substantial improvement that we can receive. So well done for uh, Christina for this homework and thank you. It was really helpful in describing the, um, the differences and the advantages of synthesis and the differences between compilation and synthesis and transpilation. So now we will continue for the next step. So for the swap test. So we covered the key insight for homework one and discussed the previous topic. Now we're starting the new topic of today. So we first discuss the motivation of the swap test, explanation on what is it, and some implementation, hands-on implementation. So the motivation, what the question we have when we address this and we're trying to come up with the swap test is how close or similar two quantum states are. And this is especially useful for quantum machine learning tasks and as we will uh, cover shortly. But the question you should have in mind is how close or similar two quantum states are. This is what we are trying to understand. And the swap test is a, a method, a tool, a algorithmic primitive that enables us to answer this question. So the definition, we have an input. The input is two quantum states. Let's call them Psi and Phi. And the output is the fidelity of psi and phi. So this is um, a measure of how close, how similar psi and phi are. So this is the definition and um, the overlap between the two. And this is what we receive. So we this is a measure of how similar, how close these two quantum states are. And shortly we will discuss some uh, further intuition of and, and limiting cases. But let's start with the algorithm itself. So we are starting with phi and psi. And then we have additional qubit. So we have additional test qubit that we are using. We apply the Hadamard, um, Ad the Hadamard gate on this additional qubit. And now we are applying the control swap. So condition, so the Hadamard on the zero, the zero state, it uh, will receive the plus state. So it's super equal superposition of zero and one. Now let's call it in the zero branch, we do not, we do nothing. So we do not swap the two gates. Uh, the two states of psi and phi, and then in the one branch or in the, the one, um, the, according to the amplitude of one, we do swap phi, uh, phi and psi. And then we do Hadamard again. So we want to uh, apply these destructive inter interferences that we used in the control swap. So this is another Hadamard gate. And then we measure. So it's quite simple, quite straightforward. So we have the two states that we are interested in. We have additional qubits that we are using along the way. We initialize it with the Hadamard, so we have an equal superposition of zero and one. Then condition or controlled by this qubit, we are applying a swap. So swap, it's swapping, just changing the, the state of psi and phi. So if, if it's one qubit, so it's just swapping the qubits. If, it's, if these states are implemented by multiple qubits, so it's a bitwise swap. 
So the first qubit of phi, phi is changed or swapped with the first qubit of psi and so on and so forth. And lastly, we apply another Hadamard and we measure. What we receive is that the from the probability of measuring the zero value of the test qubit, we can extract with this simple formula the fidelity or the overlap between these two states. So we measure the, the, the first qubit, we receive the probability or the histogram of zero and one. We take the probability of measuring the first qubit zero, multiply it by two, decrease one, and we receive this fidelity and this overlap. And this is really nice because it's quite simple, very, very useful tool, and, and, and quite straightforward. So this is quite nice. Now let's try to develop some intuition for this swap test. So if the states of psi and phi are identical, right? So if they are identical, their uh, inner product is one because it's the, the same state. Now the probability of measuring zero will be one, right? So um, we have here, we'll have one, and then we probability of measuring zero, we'll have one as well. So this is one extreme. Now, if they are completely orthogonal and their uh, inner product is zero, then the probability of measuring zero will be one half. So these are the two limiting cases. And we can see from here that we won't uh, receive something smaller than this, um, than this one half, because we we take the, the inner product and modulus square. So we'll the minimum value that we can receive for the probability of measuring zero will be one half. And these are the two limiting cases. Uh, so again, we want to understand how similar, how close these two quantum states are. We receive as input these two quantum states. We initialize another qubit as uh, auxiliary qubit, as the qubit that we uh, calculate this overlap. Hadamard on this qubit, control on this qubit, uh, control swap between the two states. If these are one qubit states, so just swap between the two. If there are multiple qubits, so bitwise swap. And then another Hadamard measuring, understanding what is the probability of zero, and then uh, one line of post-processing, and we receive this uh, fidelity, the overlap, how similar these two quantum states are. So let's discuss about, um, uh, let's say, we can call it a canonical uh, use case for this. So here we have a general unitary, which is parameterized. So we have some parameters in this unitary that we want to optimize according to something. Now we have here the unitary that initialize the, the quantum state of psi. So here we have the state psi. And here we have some unitary that we want to make um, as close as possible to the state of psi. And later on, we'll see a, a more specific example from, uh, from paper implementation. What we can do is to have this swap test in order to um, optimize the parameters of this unitary that they can do a state preparation of psi or as close as possible. And from this, we can calculate the overlap, the fidelity, but it is it, it depends on the, the, um, the variables that we have in this unitary, right? So these are the, the, the result that we receive is a function of the variables, the function of, let's say, theta. Theta can be one variable or a vector of, of, of variables, classical variables. Let's say these are angles of rotations or further um, variables, unknowns that we are trying to optimize. Now, we take this result and we're trying to maximize it. So the goal here is to create this unitary with parameters that, you will, create, that will be as similar as possible to the unitary that prepares the state psi. So, we have these parameters, we have this, this is a well-known unitary. Now we're doing the swap test. We are trying to maximize this overlap, this fidelity, it's parameterized. Then we are classically optimizing over the parameters of theta to maximize this. And then we receive a new set of parameters. We insert these new sets of parameters into the unitary. We calculate it again, and then we optimize it again. And we are doing a loop here until we are converging to something that is either a local minima or something that is a meaningful. So this is sort of the canonical example, how we use it. Now the question is, why should we do um, Why should we do it? How we do it? What are the variations that we can do? But this is a common structure that we can use the swap test for. So we have some unitary with parameters unitary that we want to create some states that we are know what the state, we know what the state is, but we don't know how to prepare it. So 
okay, here it's uh, a bit of cheating, but the cheating is only for um, training this specific unitary. And this is the way we are doing this. So I think through examples, it will uh, make it clearer, but this is the high level scheme, the high level um, canonical example of how you swap this in quantum machine learning or variation hybrid algorithms uh, in quantum computing. Now, further examples, this is also um, a paper that uses the, uses the swap test, so quantum fingerprints, and this is a famous paper, so I encourage you to go over it, to skim through, and to try to spot where they use the swap test within it. And this is an example that we will cover briefly, so quantum autoimporters for efficient compression of quantum data. So this is another paper, a research from um, the field of quantum machine learning and hybrid algorithms. Now, within the paper, we can see this figure. So let's try to understand it more according to the scheme that we have discussed in the previous slide. So here we have some general unitary and we have some parameters. And then we um, we receive, we take some of the output of this unitary and this is what we are trying to optimize. And we have a reference state. So this is the state that in the previous slide I, I showed as a U of Psi. So we prepare a reference state somehow. And then we are doing the swap test. So we want to make the this state that comes out of the unitary as close as possible to the reference state. And we measure how close they are using this swap test. We measure the, the overlap effectively. We do some of the post-processing and we compute the cost function. So the cost function is from the probability of zero. We can calculate what's the cost function, what's the overlap, what's the fidelity. And then we can maybe have some further cost function. Um, and then we start apply some optimization scheme on what we receive. And we um, have we receive from the optimization new set of parameters. And then we are doing this loop over and over again. So this is an example from this paper. Um, you can search for this paper on archive and then go through it. But now when you approach this paper, you have the ability to understand some parts of it. And this is the one of the, the, the key enabler, enabling points that quantum primitives enable you, or the key advantages of understanding and learning in depth and really, really understanding implementation and the theory and understanding the whole picture of quantum primitives is then you can come to new quantum algorithms or to new papers and decompose these new quantum algorithm that you see for the first time into those primitives, those quantum building blocks and, and further understand what's going on. So now I expect you after the, the end of this session to come and to see one kind of this algorithm. Okay, so maybe you won't understand everything here and overlap or the fidelity, you don't fully understand it, but you have the rough idea and how to apply the optimization, you might not uh, fully understand how to do it, but you can view on the circuit. You understand that here are some parameters. Here is the swap test. We are trying to understand how similar the output of this quantum state is to this reference state. So these are the words that we understand. So now you have the ability to understand um, some set of papers of a really state of the art papers that use this uh, swap test. Now, by the end of the of the full program that we'll do, you will acquire more and more quantum primitives. And I hope this will span a large variety of quantum algorithms, of state of the art quantum algorithm that you will be able to understand and then to develop yourself new quantum algorithm. So this is the why quantum primitives are so important to understand. And I think this is the best way of learning quantum algorithm in general and advanced quantum algorithm specifically is to understand the building blocks, the quantum primitives of the algorithm and not to review the hundreds or thousands of different or variation of quantum algorithm we have. So this is a tool set that you will receive. Now let's try to uh, have some critical thinking about it. So I encourage you to think why to use the swap test and not just to measure the two quantum state, right? So we can do some quantum tomography to measure the state of psi, to measure the state of phi, and then to calculate cross-processing and just do it uh, this way. So I encourage you to think and maybe to search a bit why should we do it and when should we do it, when we'll do tomography or if we'll never do tomography, but try to understand why, why we should do and we should use this swap test and not um, a different option. And another important thing is how many measurements one needs to do for achieving desired accuracy, right? So, and this is something that we'll touch in the hands-on part, but obviously if we measure with one shot, um, we won't receive anything because the probability, um, we need to acquire more shots in order to have a reliable probability. 
But what does it mean reliable probability? It depends on what is the accuracy that we want to achieve. So it is some connection between the accuracy we want to achieve of this overlap between the states and the number of shots that we want, uh, we need to, to measure. And I encourage you to think and to try to understand what are the relation uh, here. And when we, you approach or when you review some papers, you need to think, okay, it's not enough just to have the swap test if it depends on other things. So we need to understand the whole picture. So these are two points that I want you to have in mind when you think and you view and you further um, analyze and research the swap test. So this is a very useful tool. You can understand further uh, research papers and more research area within quantum machine learning. And there are some points that you need to consider when you want to use it or when you um, view or read other papers. So this is a good time for questions and then we'll move to the hands-on implementation part. And, but if there are some questions on the theory part or why you should use it or anything about the swap test, so this is a good time for having the question. Just as a reminder, the questions are to be posted in the live question channel on Discord. So I'm seeing a lot of questions posted on general questions and some other quantum algorithms channel too. If the questions are related uh, to this particular session, I would advise everyone to bring those questions to live chat so we can track everything at once. Quick question, is it possible to perform um, finding Hadamard matrix on classic? Um, I'm not sure what is meant by the Hadamard matrix. There is the Hadamard gate and anyone can use it with the classic platform uh, with the simple syntax. And um, if, if one wants to uh, further uh, explain so i'd be happy to to answer yeah so ira from indonesia if you could just clarify your question a little bit further in the chat that would be awesome another question from parsa from iran is it possible to is it possible that repeating the swap test doesn't converge to a single optimized state and if so what does that tell us about the state that's a good question so if we repeat so i assume that and measuring many times, so having a large number of shots, and if we won't converge to the desired state. So yeah, this is possible. Um, let me go back. Um, okay. So here we can see in this example, they have the reference state. Now they don't um, explain how they initialized or how they prepare this reference state. Now, for a general um, quantum state that we want to prepare, we have many, many parameters. So we have, um, I don't remember the exact numbers, but for we think for a general unitary, you have many parameters that you uh, need or may, many degrees of freedom in the Hilbert space that you need in order to create a general uh, reference state or a general state. Now, usually what we are doing is we have some, and that's we call it, some parameterized quantum circuit that we don't have the full degrees of freedom to span the entire Hilbert space of, of the number of qubits that it applied it, it applies on. So we have um, effectively what we can do is we span only a limited um, a limited space or a subspace within the Hilbert space of the of the of the full Hilbert space of the state that could be theoretically spanned. And this is usually done because it's more efficient to use fewer uh, parameters. Now the swap test, it will, in this case, will enable us to converge only to the closest point we can have to the general state. So it's highly possible that we won't span the full Hilbert space and the reference states won't be in the subspace that we span with the general unitary, with the parameters. And then we won't be able to come as close as we want, but we'll be able to come as close as we want within the subspace. Um, so this is a general um, a general thought on on this example, and also within this there are the the issues of how we can converge and how we optimize and are we in a local minima or a maximal minima, and then there are further uh, things. But you should have in mind that not always or most cases you won't be able to converge to the reference state exactly. That's a good question. Okay, thank you, Adam. Another question is from Mohammed Reza from Iran, he asked that, is it possible to deconstruct a unique setup based on different combinations of primitives? 
is it possible to construct a unique setup based on different combinations of primitives? Okay, so I'm not sure what is exactly meant in the question, but in general, um, now that we, you will view, or after the, the course that we'll finish, when you will view and um, implement and review some algorithms, you will have the ability to understand how they can be decomposed into um, different quantum primitives. And each one of them, it's, it's not just that we are taking the quantum primitive as is and plugging together. So there are some nuances um, revolving this. So I'm not sure what's the question, but I it's not that there is a, um, a list of, I don't know, 10 quantum primitives, and then we can do all the all the possible combination of these two, of these 10 quantum primitives, and we will we'll span all the algorithm in the world. So I think it's a bit more subtle than this. And you need to remember that also, when we speak about this quantum algorithm, this is one part of a general quantum algorithm. So for quantum algorithm, we can decompose it into three steps. So we need for, first to encode the data, then we evolve the data. We we actually implement the algorithm, the quantum circuit, the quantum algorithm using the quantum circuit. So this is how we evolve the data and we need to do it in a smart way. And then we need to measure and post process. So the first step and the last step are not really related to quantum primitives. So they're also primitives uh, regarding how you upload the data, you encode the data into the quantum circuit and now you measure and post process. But what we are dealing with in this course and I think the, the common thing that we think of when we speak about quantum primitives is regarding the main step, which is um, evolving the quantum algorithm on the quantum circuit. So I hope this clarifies the question. Okay, uh, one final question before we move forward. And this is coming back to the question which Ira asked on um, doing research on Hadamard gates. So a little background on, on that. She, yeah, Ira asked that, uh, finding a Hadamard gate, uh, finding a Hadamard matrix among the set of binary matrices for corresponding order is a hard problem. So this is a question more on time complexity. And this particular problem has a potential to be solved on quantum machines or particularly quantum annealing machines. Can that same routine be somehow replicated or done on classic systems? So that's a good question. So if it's something that relates to quantum algorithms. So definitely you can do, do it using classic and I'm happy to take it offline and further explain and see together how we can make it. Perfect. Great. Okay. And we'll go now. Thank you. So now we'll move to the hands-on implementation. So I encourage you now to open or ask you now to go to the docs.classic.io to the documentation. And within the uh, explore page, you have the swap test algorithm. And then you can also review what's going on in the, in the tutorial, but you can open it in the IDE. And then once you open it, we have um, um, some set of questions that I encourage you to do along the way so I can share my screen. And I want you to uh, go to this page. So you can do it from the documentation from docs.classic.io, go to the, um, the algorithms and then the swap test, or you can go from the classic IDE to the model and then you have algorithm and swap test. So these are the two options that you can access this page. And now, as you can see, we have a pre-built uh, function of swap test within the classic platform. So this is a primitive that we already implemented for you. And um, you can also implement yourself and you can call the function my swap test, for example, and then to implement. And I think it's a good exercise, optional exercise to do by yourself. But now I want you to go to this page and we will have some, um, some tasks I want you to do here that will help you to understand what's going on. So I let you do it for a second and then you can first you can view the exercises on the on the canvas platform and you can also view it here so what i want you to do is to use the pre-built example of the swap test from the ide so this is what i open for you and adapt the two states to be two qubit states with zero overlap so to be orthogonal states and I encourage you to use the prepare state function for this um, for this use case. So use a standard error bound of 0 0.01. So you can um, view what is the um, 
arguments that you should enter into proper state, and we'll do an example. But what I wanted to do is to prepare these two states. First, prepare two states with zero overlap, and then we I want you to synthesize the algorithm and execute using the classic simulator. And we want to understand two things. So what was the probability of measuring the zero in the test qubit? And is it as you expected? So there is the theoretical um, argument of what we want to achieve from the swap test. And what I want you to do now is to go through it. So I can start and show you some things we want. So first, we want to do the prepare state. So we use the prepare state, and this is the syntax that we use. So first we want to prepare state on state one. So we want to prepare the state on the prepare state of this um, qubit array. Now let's say we want to prepare the state one, um, zero, zero, zero. So this is a two qubit state. And the second argument here should be um, the error bound. So and um, we won't dive into too much details here, but when we are doing a prepare state, so this is a function that does a prepare state. And um, so we have some, the desired state. So here we have a desired set of probabilities, not amplitudes, probabilities that we want to have. So we want to have a um, full probability or probability of one measuring the qubit array state one in the state zero, and then zero for measuring it in all other states. And, the error bound is how um, the how the the prepare state function. What is the the gap or the functional uh, freedom that it can use in order to make it as accurate as possible? So usually, when we want to do something more accurate, we need larger circuit depth and more resources. So this is how many resources we need, and you can ignore it for now for now and just use the zero point zero one. Now let's do an example. So I can copy and paste. Um, this and I'm going to do state two. And now I prepare the two states to be identical, right? So I prepare the state here and prepare the state here, both to be identical. And I'm using the swap test. So I'm, I don't need to, to understand now how it is implemented the swap test. I can just use this function, this quantum primitive, and then I can synthesize it. Now we can view what's going on here. So I can view the circuit. So I have one block of state preparation, another block of state preparation, and the swap test. Now the swap test receives state one, it receives state two, and it also uses a test uh, qubit. Now we can zoom in and understand the swap test, right? So this is exactly how we thought it should be. So we have the Hadamard, and then we have control swap. And the control swap is bitwise swap. So we have a control on the first qubit of each state, so of state one, and we are, see, do it, we are doing control swap on first qubit of state one and first qubit of state two, and then we're doing a control swap on the second qubit of state one, the second qubit of state two, another Hadamard, and we finish like this. So this is what I want you to do, and then I want you to execute and to run it on a simulator. So. This is the first exercise. And now if I share the slide again, so I want you to go and over what we did now to use the previous example of the swap test from the IDE, adapt the two states to be two qubit states with zero overlap. So what we did now is not zero overlap and you can think, so zero overlap are two orthogonal states. Now we did something different and use the prepare state function. And I want you to run it and to understand what was the probability of measuring zero in the test qubit, and is it as you expected? So this is the exercise, and um, I can go back in a second and show you the formula that we wanted to have and how we calculate the fidelity from the zero probability, but please um, do it alongside. So now we have sort of a roughly 10 minute session of hands-on or five to 10 minute session of hands-on and just for you to acquire the more capabilities of what is the swap test. Hayden, would it be possible to just go back and walk the participants through the code? People are trying it hands-on, so they have fallen a little back on trying to keep up with everything that's going on. Yeah, also, sure. Um, for some of the participants, the IDE comes with, it's already populated with prepared amplitudes. 
So can they see if they remove that stuff before trying this out? So sorry, if they can use the prepare amplitudes instead? Yeah, for them, the IOD already has prepared amplitudes. Should they remove that before doing this or yeah. should we just keep it as is and continue with this code? Yeah, so if we press on the swap test, we have some example here and we should follow the tutorial in order to understand this example further. Um, so if I'm going to docs.classic and I'm going to explore and then I'm going to algorithms and I'm going to the swap test algorithm. So this covers the example that we have. So this is the Python code of the example. Um, and we can see how it is prepared with the Python. And first thing, I encourage you just to open this swap test uh, with the prepare amplitude, as you said, to synthesize, to view the algorithm, to understand that everything runs smoothly on your uh, computer, that you know how to synthesize, to run, to view the circuit, view that you have the swap test, and, and, and then to continue to the next phase. Here we can see that we have we are preparing a state with three qubits, not with two qubits. Uh, we are using the prepare amplitudes instead of the prepare state. So this is a more complicated example. And um, so yes, to answer the question, what you the this participants you will need to do is to delete these two lines and instead of prepare amplitudes to have prepare state of state one and prepare state of state two. Now if I'm bringing back the code from earlier. So um, the only thing from these two lines now that I have on the screen that the participant should do is to change the prepared state of state two to some state that you're orthogonal to state one. Sure, right. Are there any further questions that I can answer uh, meanwhile? Yeah, no questions as of now. Okay, there is one. Um, yeah, just a little bit earlier from the session, but is the U, capital U, theta, uh, the parameterization unit tree is to check how psi is oriented towards the angle theta? Um, Okay, so can you repeat the question? So we had, I will go back to the slides and we had here. Right, so the question is that does theta, the parameterization unitary, check how psi is oriented towards the angle theta? Um, yeah, you can, one can, think about it this way, we need to remember that psi is a quantum state and theta is a classical vector of parameters. So um, with this scheme that we see here, there is some connection or we can have some mapping between each uh, classical vector of parameters theta and the quantum state psi that implements it. Um, but they live on different uh, spaces in the mathematical world. So this is a quantum state that is part of the Hilbert space of the specific number of qubits uh, that is spanned by. And this is a classical vector of parameters and they can be real parameters or complex parameters. And um, there can be different di dimen dimensions between the vector parameters and the psi state. Um, but as we can see here, each vector of parameters um, creates or is connected to a psi one quantum state psi. Right. There's another question Archit from India asks, if you already have a prepared some state phi, uh, why do we need to use a parameterization uh, circuit or a variation circuit to create that uh, like an identical state again? That's a great question. Um, so let's see if we can understand it from this example. Not exactly. So um, many possible answers. One is that usually we are not interested in actually being able to um, do it again. 
Um, or that's not exactly two. One is we can find a more efficient way to implement psi. So as I said, um, usually we need uh, many, many degrees of freedom in order to, um, to implement psi. And maybe we can find some shortcut that we can use in other quantum algorithms that we implement psi using fewer number of parameters. So a smaller unitary that will create almost the same uh, state psi. So this is one possible answer. Another possibility is that, okay, we know the state of psi, but we want to have some family of states. So not the specific psi, but maybe some family um, of states. And we want a unitary that will prepare this family of states. So we can optimize over the parameters using psi and then optimize over the, pro the parameters for another state and then find some um, logical mixture that will span a, a wide range of, uh, of states within a given family. Um, so this can be another direction. So several aspects. And then in the quantum mode encoder, so this is another example. Um, I encourage people to go through it. I'm not too familiar with the specific implementation here, but again, here we can see that the reference state will have, in general, have some uh, many degrees of freedom. And here, probably what they have here is a limited set of parameters that they optimize um, for. So it's not necessarily that they, they have a perfect overlap between the state that they prepare with the unitary um, U and the reference state, but they will try to get as close as possible using fewer number of parameters. That's a good question. Wonderful. I think the participants are now trying that on their own. And some of them also shared some histograms and are asking how to interpret the histograms on this part chat. Okay, that's a great question. So I can see from, um, let's go back to the platform. And if we execute and we have, um, let's say 100 shots. Now we can see here that there is a perfect overlap. Now we can change on the filters from counts to probabilities. And um, so here we can see the probability. Now I see in the chat, there is a, a histogram with 517. So I encourage you to use the filter and change it to probability. And then you can understand it as probability. And the formula for connecting the probability to the overlap that we want to receive is this formula. So two times the probability minus one is the overlap that we are trying to uh, extract. So you have the formula also in the in the exercises on the canvas, but this is the formula that we want to, to have. And from the measured probability, we want to, to extract or to do this uh, small calculation step. So I, you don't need to finish all the three exercises now, but um, on the high level, I want you to um, to do the, the first exercise with orthogonal states. So we covered um, one different aspect. So we, we, um, we covered exercise two, actually. So we repeated exercise one. So we started exercise one, but we adapted the two states to be two qubits with perfect overlap, right? And so what we did is that we prepared the state and we prefer the two states to be identical. So we prefer two states to be the zero state effectively. And then when we measured, when we measured them, we receive a um, probability of one being in the zero state and two times one minus one is a fidelity of one. So this is what we expected because we created a state that is um, perfect in that sense. So um, I can give you a hint. So let's say if we change if we change it to this state. So you should think what will be um, what will be the value. So will it be something that is with um, fully orthogonal? So the overlap will be zero. And what is the probability in this case? Um, and you can also try to think if you prepare probability of 0 0.5 and 0 0.5. So there is some maybe overlap between the two states. So I encourage you to play around and to connect what you measure with the probability 
to the value that you receive here. So this is what I expect the participants to do. Now um, we can continue to the next phase or um, Vardan, do you recommend having a few minutes break or should we continue to the next part? Yeah, let's just have a couple of minutes for the participants to try. They're still trying to catch up with the online ID and running the circuits. Perfect. Um, yeah, sometimes I, yeah, I understand people having a hard time to catch up with a live lecture. So if it's, yeah, it's absolutely okay if you're not able to do all three just yet, you can try with the first exercise and if there's something left, you can go on to the YouTube recording later on and complete the exercises. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. The, the reason I want participants to start and implement throughout the lecture is I think when we are trying to actually code a quantum algorithm and an algorithm in general, we really understand it. So there is one thing to understand in theory, but when we need to hands-on do and implement it and execute and analyze the result, this is a completely new thing. So it's even if not, uh, if participants won't be able to finish all the exercises, and if in, even if not to finish any exercise, just the 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 effort of trying to code it, it uh, raises many questions that uh, clarifies the understanding of how to do it. So what are the states? What is the quantum state? How we prepare them? What does it mean in overlap? So I think the these um these terms and these ideas are becoming way more concrete when we actually try to code it in in a specific way. And I think the classic platform is very useful for this because we can quite um, intuitively and easily experiment with the IDE. We don't need to um, raise a Python or to install a Python environment and to do something um, more extensive. So through, throughout when we have ideas, we can use the IDE to experiment and to go over um, the things. Perfect. And for all the participants who are doing this right now, I would advise you to keep on sharing your final histograms on the live chat so everyone is aware that you are performing and you're getting the results. And it also gives us a sense that, yeah, people are, uh, yeah, doing it correctly. Another question for you, um, Aiden, is on, yeah, does Classy use an ancillary free swap test? An ancillary free swap test. Um, I'm not sure what is the ancilla that is referred here. So as we've seen, so in the swap test, we have um, the test qubit or the overlap qubit that we use. Um, we can think about it as an and ancilla qubit, and then we have the two states. So I assume the question is if we can have some swap test without using this additional qubit. Um, I don't think I don't think it is possible in general. So it doesn't. Um, it's not related to no. So we need to do this control in a control way, and we we need at least one additional qubit in order to do so. Um, and if we don't have this additional qubit, so there, there is no option. So in this regard, this quantum primitive doesn't require a, a lot of playing around between, uh, or there are not so many different implementations. So there is, for this quantum primitive, there is one implementation, it's straight, straightforward, and we use this implementation in, in other, um, or this primitive in other algorithms, but there is no too much of, of a thing to do here. Beside the fact that the control swap, there are, might be multiple implementations within the control swap. Right. And from the histograms and the images shared on the Discord chat, I am, yeah, I understand that most participants are doing it correctly. If they are receiving a 100% probability for the zero state, I think that is good. And then if you change it to an orthogonal state, then the probability should also change, right? Yeah, definitely. So the overlap, the pro the overlap is two times the probability of measuring zero minus one. So if the probability of measuring zero um, will be one half, so we receive the overlap to be zero. And then if the probability of measuring zero will be one, the overlap will be um, one as well. So these are the two extreme cases that we covered um, at the beginning. And then there are middle cases 
of understanding between zero overlap and uh, between zero fidelity and uh, full fidelity or um, completely identical states. Perfect. Okay, yeah, I think we can move forward uh, now. Perfect. So I encourage the participants to um, continue after the lecture to play around and to um, get a feeling or a proper feeling of what is the swap test and to see the different, the three different uh, cases. And I think this is the, the a bit more challenging part to create the fidelity of zero. So you need to think um, what to do with this two qubit uh, state. Um, but I'm quite certain that the participants will be able to do it um, after a few minutes of thinking. So we will move to the next part of the session, the third and last part of today's lecture. And this is the Hadamard test. So this is another quantum primitive. It's, a, let's say, a close cousin of the swap test. And we can, uh, we'll start with the motivation, explanation. And for this test, we will create, and I'll do a live demo how we implement this Hadamard test. And this will be the, um, the foundation for the homework assignment that you will have. So, what is the motivation? What is the question that we are coming when you want to understand the Adama test? Is how to evaluate the expectation value of a given unitary matrix for a specific quantum state. So even this question is, is super fundamental in, in quantum physics in general and quantum algorithm computing in particular. So we are given uh, many unitaries and we are dealing always with unitaries and we have the quantum states. And the first thing, or one of the first things that we actually want to do is to evaluate the expectation value of a given unitary that we implement using quantum circuit for a specific quantum state. So this is really, really a fundamental thing that we want to achieve. Now, what is the standard way of um, calculating or evaluating expectation values? Usually we decompose the unitary into a sum of power strings. So I'm covering here a flow that is common. Sometimes it's swept under the rug when we are dealing with quantum algorithms, um, but it's really fundamental to understand what is the standard way to do it. So we have a general unitary and the Pauli operators or string of parties, they span the entire, the entire unitary that we can um, evaluate. So we decompose a given unitary into sum of Pauli strings. So in one dimensional with one qubit, we can decompose it to x, y, z, and identity. And then in a, with two qubits, we decompose it to um, some Pauli string. So let's say x, z, and then i, i, and then i, y, and so on and so forth. So we span the given unitary on all the, using all the Pauli strings. Now we express each Pauli in the standard basis using a change of basis transformation. So what does it mean? At the end, with quantum computers, we need to measure only in the standard, or we are able to measure in the general framework only in the standard basis. So for measuring the standard basis, we need to express all the Paulis that we have using the Z Pauli and the identity, because these can be um, extracted in the post-processing with post-processing from the standard uh, basis measurement. So we need to do some uh, transformation. So for example, the X Pauli can be or can be expressed using transformation um, with Hadamard, Z Hadamard. So we do some Hadamard transformation um, and then we, in this other basis using the Hadamard, we apply the Z and this is the X Pauli. So we need to apply for all the Pauli strings and for the Y operator, there's a different uh, transformation that we need to do, but we need to express everything in terms of Z and identity in the middle using the transformation. Now, after we express, so this is a mathematical uh, way, we need to apply the transformation. So in we actually apply, for example, here, we apply a Hadamard gate on the state in order to measure. And then after we measure in the computational basis, we can extract it. So the next step is to measure independently each non-commutative Pauli string. So this is a subtle point, but at the end, when we decompose the unitary, we can receive a sum of Pauli strings. So for example, we can receive a unitary that is implemented with the, on one qubit with x plus um, z. So these are not commutative. And then we need to measure two times. And for each measurement, we need to do multiple shots. So we need to measure independently each non-commutative power string. And then we need to post-process the result in order to evaluate the expectation value. 
So firstly, I think this is uh, good to know in general because this is the standard way of how we actually evaluate expectation values um, on quantum computers. And this is a topic that's swept under the rug, but it's quite uh, complicated, we can say, and there is some nuances and we need to do, to do this decomposition and transformation. And it can be quite expensive, both theoretically and implementation wise. Now the Hadamard test is another way or maybe a shortcut to actually evaluate this uh, expectation value of the state. So this is really nice. Now the five steps and everything that I covered earlier, for now you can forget it. You should remember or understand it later, but the Hadamard test will give you a shortcut how you can do it in a straightforward way. So the input is a quantum state psi and a unitary u, and the output is the real part of the expectation value of, un of the unitary u with the state psi. Now there is a, va a variant of the algorithm that we can calculate the imaginary part as well, and then we can evaluate the uh, expectation value in general, but the standard way is to evaluate the real part of the expectation value. How we do it? So we start with the state psi, and then we have one additional qubit. We initialize the qubit with Hadamard, and then we apply a control unitary. So we are given the unitary, we just need to apply the control unitary. We're doing another Hadamard, we measure, and from the measurement, the real part of the expectation value is two times the probability of measuring zero minus one. So as we can see, it's very, very similar to the swap test. And, and one can understand the swap test as a variation of the Hadamard test. But this is straightforward. And we are given the state psi, or we initialize the state psi. We are given the unitary, another test qubit, and Hadamard control unitary, control unitary Hadamard measuring and receiving the, um, or extracting probability of zero and calculating the post-processing. So this is very nice, very useful, very intuitive compared to the five steps that we did earlier. There is only the subtle, but the uh, significant challenge of implementing a controlled unitary. Now, this is the point where using high level functional design is becoming super useful because you don't need to think about the implementation itself. You are given the unitary and in a few minutes we will code and do a demo um, of this life. And then um, the implementation, the synthesis engine of Classic, the compiler, transformed this high level modeling of controlled unitary to actual circuit implementation. And now we can view that if the unitary itself has further multi control not or MCXs, so it becomes very um, beneficial to use the synthesis engine because you can tweak the parameters of maximum width or maximum depth and further optimize the algorithm. So let's develop some intuition and the extreme use case, the cases. So if the real part of the expectation value is one, then the probability of measuring zero is one. So let's try to calculate here. So we have the real part of the expectation value. So this is one, and then we understand, okay, the probability of measuring zero is one. Now, if the real part of the expectation value is zero, so this is zero, the probability of measuring zero is one half. And if the real part of measuring the probability is minus one, so the probability is zero, of measuring zero in the test or the expectation value qubit is also zero. So here, um, not as we had in the swap test, here we can also measure um, zero in the, in the test qubit. Now, in order to understand some examples, so I encourage you to go to the archive. So archive is the um, a preprint that we have for um, for papers in the in the community in the physics community um, in general, and it's a great place to view and to to read and to research for what's going on in the in the quantum ecosystem. So I encourage you to go and search over there, Hadamard test, and you can specifically search for the abstract. And there are 138 results for having Hadamard test in the abstract. Now, if you search for the full text, you receive many more results. So these are all papers, research papers, and you can um, um, filter according to the new papers or more relevant or anything that you want. But these are papers that are using this Hadamard test so state-of-the-art research that uses this Adamar test as if it's it's mentioned in the abstract, so it's a, in a key part of the algorithm. So now you have access, or after you understand what is the Adamar test, you can now read 138 research papers. Many of them are super relevant state-of-the-art quantum algorithm, and this gives you another tool set of understanding what's going on. 
Now, this is one of the papers over there. Um, I wasn't familiar with this paper before, but this is quantum ion mitigation for Fourier moment computation. And this is the work done. Now, scrolling uh, with you know, skimming through the paper, we can see these two figures. So the first figure, we actually see the Hadamard test, right? So we Hadamard, and then we apply some control unitaries. Here, here they have um, three unitaries. So we can think about this as a concatenation of unitaries, but this is one unity, another Hadamard. So this is from the paper. Now we can really understand, okay, this is a primitive. This is something that we can understand, a structure of the algorithm. And this is another a variant of the Hadamard test. So here we can see that the, it's not exactly Hadamard control Hadamard. They have some additional um, additional gate. And I think I don't understand, I, and I haven't read fully the specific thing here, but I can, from what I know and I understand, this uh, could be used to, uh, to evaluate the imaginary part of the expectation value. So again, even if you don't exactly know and you, you don't uh, research through the entire and read carefully the paper, that can take long, just for skimming through the papers and understanding the, the concepts, you can get the feeling of the paper. And I think this is also a really useful technique and tool when you want to uh, review many papers or you want to review a field or get a feeling of what's going on in the field. So you don't need to um, read in depth the papers in order to understand everything, you can skim through. Them. And now that you can spot some primitives and some construct that you understand, it's very useful in understanding the bigger picture without diving into details. And then once you uh, you know what you want to read, so you can invest the time and, and learn it carefully. And this is super important, but the first phase is to have some intuition. So these are two figures from the paper and already now you can have a feeling of what's going on over there. Um, so let's go with the hands-on implementation. Maybe I will have a quick round of questions or maybe two or three questions if there are some important question. And if not, we will continue to the hands-on implementation. Um, so for then if there are, if you feel that there are um, some repeated question in the chat, so um, I can stop for a moment. And if not, we can continue with the implementation. Yeah, I think most of the questions uh, the participants have tried to answer them to one another, so that's wonderful. One question, the example that you just mentioned, was that done on the IDE by the participants themselves, or is it a preloaded example which they can just uh, start working on similar to the swap test example? Okay, so now we will touch it and no, this is not a pre-built example. And now I will code it um, uh, live with the participant. Um, so this is what we are trying to evaluate. So I'm continuing now with, um, with what we are trying to do. So we are trying to evaluate the expectation value of the quantum Fourier transform matrix. So this is a common matrix, a common unitary that we used in quantum computing and we are doing the applying the quantum Fourier transform. And um, so for this, we in classic, we can just write Q of T and then apply it on anything that we want to do. So we want to apply to evaluate the expectation value of the quantum Fourier transform for the zero state using four qubits. So this is the task that we want to have. Now, this is the final circuit that we expect to have. So we want to have Hadamard and then a control quantum Fourier transform and then another Hadamard. And this is the code and how we'll do it. So I will go quickly through the logic that we have and then we'll implement it um, together. So we can play around with the outputs, but what we will have is first we initialize a qubit, which will be the expectation value. We initialize um, the quantum register psi that we will apply the QFT on. And then we use the within apply um, construct of classic. So you covered it in the classic 101, but we apply the transformation. So here the within apply effectively say, okay, now we are applying the Hadamard on the expectation value. And this is the first act that we are doing. Then we apply some operation and then automatically the construct know to, um, to apply the inverse of the, of the action that we used first. So, within applying a Hadamard on the expectation value. So it automatically says, okay, we'll have an Hadamard in the beginning. I will have an Hadamard at the end on the expectation value qubit. What I want to do between these Hadamard, I want to apply a control. So control on the expectation value 
qubit, um, I want to apply the quantum Fourier transform matrix or the quantum Fourier transform unitary. So now we will go to the um, to the part. So we will code it together. So I think it will uh, give you more intuition of how we can do things. So first we have the main function and what we want to have at the end, the output should be the expectation uh, value and it should be cubed. Now, first I want to, to allocate. So allocate is initialized. I want to initialize um, this expectation value qubit. And this is the syntax that we use. Now I want to declare because the only thing that I'm interested in as the output is the expectation value qubit. But now what I need to do as well, I, I want to have um, the psi quantum register. Um, and I want to initialize this quantum register with four qubits. So in these two parts, I initialize the expectation value and I have the also the psi um, quantum array, a quantum register that I declared here and initialized here. Now I'm applying the actual Hadamard test. So within, and then we'll have some action here, and then we have apply, and then we'll have another action here. So what we are doing first, and we want to apply the Hadamard on the expect expectation value, right? So this is the first thing that we want to do. So we apply the Hadamard on the expectation um, value qubit. And then what we want to do, we want to apply a control. So we have the pre-built um, or the construct of the cumulative language. So control on what? Control on the expectation value. So what we want to do control on the expectation value, we want to apply the QFT um, on the psi register. So this is what we want to achieve. Let's see if we have some errors or we can synthesize. So expectation value is undefined. So what does it mean? Let's see here. Um, so we have your expectation value. Now it means that we have some um, error in the syntax here. So um, this is a mean indicative error message. So now we can see that all the expectation value are um, with the correct syntax. So thank you for the error message classic platform. And that's great because now we can actually receive um, the implementation. So as we can see, we have the Hadamard and then we have the control uh, QFT and then we have Hadamard again. So we can zoom in and understand how the, the QFT is working, but this is what we um, want to achieve. So first I encourage you now to go and to implement it yourself. So I see there is a print screen in the, in the Discord. Um, I can also um, share the code, but I encourage you just to go over and to go over and to implement it yourself. So as I said, it's totally different to um, see an implementation and to implement it yourself. So um, even if you're just copying and pasting, try to play around and see that you understand what's going on on the high level. Now, once we have uh, the implementation, what I will want you to do, and now the we are approaching the end of the session, so we will do it at home. So I want you to follow the implementation that we just did and call the, in the ID, the Adama test for calculating the real part of the expectation value of the QFT a unitary with uh, at the state zero with four qubits. So the first two lines we already did together, you have the code in the, uh, in the Discord chat, but I encourage you also to try to code it by yourself, maybe from the print screen, maybe from the recording, and it's a different thing. Now execute the algorithm from the ID with 1000 shots and calculate the real part of the expectation value using the formula. So this is the general formula. Um, so the real part of what we want to achieve is two times the probability of measuring zero my, uh, minus one. And the question is, is it what you expect it to be? So you need to understand what is the quantum Fourier transform unitary and what should be theoretically the expectation value of the zero uh, in the zero state. And, a hint, should it be 
a real value, so we don't need to take the real part of the real value because it's already real, or it's a complex value and then we won't receive. So you should think about these things. And then I want you to repeat exercise one, but now execute the algorithm with 2000 shots. So, and then you, I want you to, I want to ask you, is the result better and better in what sense? Is it closer through the theoretical value? And then I want you to repeat it with 5,000 shots and then to understand if it's better. And this is, this touches on the point that we, um, we, I discussed earlier. So how many shots and what is the convergence of the uh, algorithm according to the number of shots we have and according to the accuracy that we want to achieve. So these exercises help you to start going through it. And then you have the homework assignment, which is a bit more um, elaborative than this. And in the homework assignment, you will show me what is the convergence. So you will show me and you will, what you need to do is to submit um, a graph and everything is detailed over there, but to submit a graph of the same uh, thing that we are doing here. So evaluating the expectation value of the quantum Fourier transform in the zero state. And you, you will need to execute it to run it with different number of shots. So one time with 1,000 shots, 2,000, 5,000, et cetera. So everything is explained over there. And then I want to see a graph of what is the uh, value of this uh, real expectation uh, value as a function of the number of shots. And I want to add also the theoretical value and to see and to understand if there is a relation, if we converge as we increase the number of shots, if there is a limit, and this is the, the assignment will answer one of the questions that we had earlier. So the question was, can we um, measure as many times we want and to get closer as possible? And this will um, address this kind of question. So we have the implementation in the, in the chat, in the Discord. You have also in the recording that you can see the implementation. This is what you need to implement. By yourself, you need to understand and calculate theoretically what is the, the, the expectation value. And then once you have this implementation and you have also the QMOD attached in the, in the canvas, you need to code it in the Python. So the homework assignment will have to do the same thing to implement in Python and then to do the post-processing um, using the Python SDK.